Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the first live session of our free online event series, The Compassionate Brain, hosted by Dr. Rick Hansen. My name is Randy Rourke. I'm a producer here at Sounds True, and I'm excited to be introducing this series tonight. For this week's session, How the Mind Changes the Brain, Dr. Hansen will be joined by Dr. Richie Davidson, a professor of psychology at the University of Wisconsin. Dr. Davidson is broadcasting live from Madison, Wisconsin, and Dr. Hansen is live from San Rafael, California, and I and the Sounds True team are all here in our Boulder studio. So please welcome Dr. Hansen and Dr. Davidson. Great. Well, I also want to welcome everyone who's participating in the series, uh, both live and uh, if you happen to watch it uh, via the archive, to uh, welcome you as well. Uh, for me, and I know this is true for Richie and as well for it Sounds True and everyone there, it's such an important topic. Uh, it's a universally, I think, uh, and eternally, if you will, important topic, compassion and how to warm our hearts and, and sense into the suffering of others. But these days, uh, with 7 billion plus uh, caveman, cavewoman brains, as it were, crammed together in a very small lifeboat, given our history in which the uh, stranger uh, was often a potentially lethal threat, uh, more than ever, we need to have some feeling for how to find that balanced place where we can uh, let our hearts be moved uh, by the tears and sorrows of others while still taking care of our own needs. So I'm very pleased about this series and pleased about the opportunity for it. Um, I'm also particularly pleased to have my friend and teacher, uh, Richie Davidson, here with us. Uh, Richie is, is truly a legendary um, figure, and one of the things that has struck me about him in particular is how modest uh, he continues to be. Uh, I'll uh, read you a bit of a description about him and then uh, toss a question his way and we'll get going. So. Richie, uh, Dr. Richard Davidson is uh, one of the world's leading scientists, truly, in the emerging field of affective neuroscience and contemplative neuroscience. He's the founder and chair of the Center for Investigating Healthy Minds at the Weissman Center, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, in, in 1992, the Dalai Lama challenged Dr. Davidson uh, to apply the rigors of science to study positive qualities of mind which could balance the emphasis uh, in the history of psychology on negative qualities of mind. Uh, since then, Dr. Davidson has devoted his life to uncovering research findings that could help relieve human suffering and increase happiness. He's published hundreds of scientific papers and edited 14 books. Just a few years ago, he was named one of the 100 most influential people in the world today by Time Magazine. Um, he's close to the Dalai Lama. He's, he's had a long participation in the wonderful Mind and Life Institute, and he's a sought-after speaker internationally. Uh, just in the last past few months, he's been invited to participate in the World Economic Forum in Switzerland uh, to a UN meeting in New York. Uh, he's uh, been a guest at the Templeton Prize Award Ceremony with the Dalai Lama in London, and uh, was at a meeting recently at the White House on neuroscience, games, and well-being. Uh, his new book I recommend very, very highly, The Emotional Life of Your Brain, uh, written in part with uh, Susan Begley, or Sharon Begley, rather. It's been a New York Times bestseller, um, and uh, I recommend it, as I said, wholeheartedly. Uh, to finish, uh, Richie is... Uh, the William James and Vilas Professor of Psychology and Psychiatry. Uh, he's at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, the director of the Weissman Brain Imaging Lab and the Lab for Affective Neuroscience, um, all at UW-Madison, where he's been a faculty member since 1984. And last, much less formally, I can tell you, this is a really heartfelt, uh, deeply wise person who walks his talk. So welcome, Dr. Davidson. Thank you so much for having me, Rick. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you all to the listeners who are participating. Great. Well, to dive right in, so, and I'll, I'll call you Reggie, I hope that's okay. Please um, do. Yeah. Why to you personally, and this is a question I'll be asking each one of our guests, why does it matter to you personally, uh, to uh, compassion and the, and the brain? Why do you think these are important subjects? Why do you care enough about them to take the time out to talk with us today? Well, I think compassion is a um, quality or a capacity that each of us have. Uh, every human being uh, 
I believe, is born with an innate potential to express compassion. And uh, I believe that uh, compassion actually is uh, um, uh, a very uh, uh, um, intrinsic and important quality that uh, is critical for sustained well-being, uh, and it's also critical for harmonious uh, social relationships. Uh, I think that when people comment that uh, uh, there is too little compassion in our world today, I think that uh, what we're really confronted with is the um, uh, the obscurations, the uh, the things that cloud or, or mask our ability to express uh, our compassion. But I think that uh, each of us really has uh, the seeds of compassion within us. Uh, and when I first began this work, as you mentioned in your kind introduction, Rick, uh, in 1992, I first met His Holiness the Dalai Lama, uh, and he did challenge me at that meeting, and he said, you've been using the tools of modern neuroscience to study qualities like fear and anxiety and depression. Why can't you use those same tools to study kindness and compassion? And uh, the the answer was not a very good one, uh, which was that it's hard to study kindness and compassion, but when we first began to study fear and anxiety, that wasn't easy either. And I think most neuroscientists would agree that we've made a considerable amount of progress in our understanding of fear and anxiety through neuroscientific research. So we know in the West that one of the um, important strategies, certainly not the only strategy, but an important strategy for probing the mind is to better understand the brain. Uh, and uh, we uh, were challenged and stimulated by His Holiness's comments uh, that um, uh, uh, we began a program of research to begin to investigate this. And it's our hope uh, that through this kind of research, we can first bring more attention to the importance of this quality. Uh, the second is we perhaps can discover uh, effective ways of nurturing this kind of capacity. Uh, and if we are able to find effective ways to nurture it and we have scientific evidence to show that, um, that we indeed can nurture it and that the process of nurturing uh, this quality actually can change the brain, uh, that would help to, in some sense, um, open doors, I think, and to... Uh, promote the more widespread incorporation of these practices into mainstream uh, avenues in our culture, mainstream um, activities in our culture, such as healthcare and education, both of which I think um, most people would agree might benefit from uh, injecting a little bit more compassion. So um, those are some of the reasons why I feel extremely passionate about this enterprise and very committed to uh, doing everything I can to uh, help put compassion squarely within the scientific uh, mainstream. Right. Well, Richie, you've really been uh, a central figure in that uh, movement uh, to bring compassion into the mainstream of science, as you put it. Uh, before getting into some general questions about how the mind can change the brain, I'd like to start by asking you uh, what you mean by that word, compassion. Can we bring it down to earth? What's it mean? Well, you know, one definition is the recognition uh, of another person's suffering accompanied by the disposition to relieve that suffering. Mm-hmm. Right, the wish that others not suffer, in effect. Yes. Would you I distinguish that from kindness, which some people speak of as the wish that, that others be happy, and therefore, which does not presuppose the suffering in another person. Uh, it could include suffering in another person, but its uh, focus is on happiness rather than the ending of suffering. Right. Well, I think all of those are uh, very closely related. Yeah. Can a person have compassion for themselves? Uh, I think they can, and I think this is something that uh, uh, we seem to be particularly concerned about here in the West. Um, uh, I think 
Mostly compassion is an other-oriented emotion. Uh, that is, its target is toward other people, helping to relieve suffering in other people. But I think that um, uh, in the West, uh, uh, given the kinds of psychological struggles that many people have, uh, self-compassion is also um, uh, uh, a very legitimate target of compassion uh, and I think can be very beneficial. Hmm. That's great. Um, okay, then on, if we could, to uh, some general information, uh, both for this uh, interview as well as for the series in general, as to how the mind can change the brain. I mean, this, as you well know, is the territory of experience-dependent neuroplasticity. And I wondered if you could um, offer some foundational information, uh, kind of uh, help people appreciate the ways in which their everyday thoughts and feelings can actually be sculpting neural structure for better and for worse. Could you speak to that uh, a bit? Sure, certainly. Uh, uh, it's important to, um, to frame this in um, uh, a proper conceptual context from the perspective of Western science. And uh, as you know, Rick, uh, neuroplasticity uh, is a very central concept to uh, this work. Neuroplasticity refers to the idea <clears throat> that the brain can change in response to experience and in response to training. And probably the greatest discoveries of the last uh, decade in modern neuroscience concern the many different mechanisms of plasticity. Uh, the brain is literally built to change in response to experience and to change in response to training. It's the only organ in the body which is really designed explicitly for that purpose. And uh, we now understand something about the mechanisms uh, that are responsible for plasticity, and they are varied. Uh, they range from new connections being formed uh, to uh, uh, new um, uh, 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 cells actually um, growing in the brain, new brain cells, new neurons, uh, uh, and uh, many other related kinds of processes. Uh, and so uh, when we talk about neuroplasticity, we talk about both the structural and the functional changes in the brain. And it's important for viewers to understand that our brains are constantly being shaped wittingly or unwittingly. Uh, so uh, even if we're not engaged in any kind of intentional strategy to change our minds or our brains, our brains are constantly being shaped by the forces around us. Uh, if we have an argument with uh, a friend uh, or a family member, that will shape our brain. If we have a warm um, positive interaction with someone, that will shape our brain. Uh, if we watch um, uh, television, uh, depending upon its content, that will shape our brain in one way or another. Uh, everything that we do, literally, is constantly shaping our brain. And one of the exciting invitations in this uh, area in which we're discussing is the invitation to take more responsibility for our own brains. Um, by engaging in certain um, more intentional strategies to cultivate positive states of mind, we can actually um, shape our brains in uh, ways that may, in fact, be healthier uh, and ways that can uh, promote qualities like compassion and lead to enduring happiness. And so uh, the idea uh, that through training the mind we can change the brain is simply predicated on the understanding that when we intentionally direct our mind uh, in certain ways, that literally uh, is sculpting the brain. Um, from a kind of hard-nosed Western neuroscience perspective, some neuroscientists would say it's the brain changing the brain. Uh, but... Uh, uh, using more understandable language, uh, I would say that it's the mind uh, that is shaping the brain by uh, engaging in certain kinds of intentional mental states, uh, we can systematically produce changes in the brain. Right. That slippery word, mind, uh, maybe we could take a moment with it. Um, I've heard uh, and read neuroscientists essentially 
by the word mind, lowercase m, uh, refer to the entirety of the information in the nervous system, stored in, signaled by, received by, operated upon, uh, instruction sets, and so forth. Um, and so they're staying within the frame, if you will, of materiality, the naturalist frame, the frame of Western science. When they talk about mental activity, for example, as flows of information that correlate with underlying flows of neural activity that potentially can lead to structural changes in the brain itself. I mean, would you think of mind or, or synonyms like mental uh, in this general sense? Uh, this is a really complicated uh, area, and to really do it justice would require uh, a few more hours of time. Uh -huh. uh, so, uh, you know, I, I would simply say that uh, investigating compassion doesn't require that we solve this problem. Right, right. And uh, we can make good progress uh, without any firm resolution. And my own view, uh, to sort of summarize it in a nutshell, uh, is that this is a wonderful opportunity for us to learn to practice humility uh, in all the <laughs> things we don't know. That's great. That's great. Okay, so then speaking of compassion training, um, you know, you've referred to the contemplatives, or I were quoted at least this saying, as, as them as the Olympic athletes of mental training. And uh, sometimes, of course, to really understand what's possible, it's very helpful to study people that have made it their life's practice. And you've been a pioneer in the study of uh, contemplatives and contemplative practice, including compassion practice. Uh, could you let us know some of the major things you've found uh, in your uh, examinations, if you will, your research on uh, the brains of contemplatives, particularly with regard to compassion or compassion meditation? Uh, certainly. So um, we have studied this uh, both in uh, long-term contemplative practitioners and I'll say a little bit more about who those individuals are, uh, as well as more novice practitioners. So uh, I'd be happy to talk about each. But as you say, Rick, we, when we first began this work, uh, we elected to study very long-term practitioners because we reasoned that uh, they are the putative experts, at least in this, and uh, we wanted to see what we can find in them. If we weren't able to see anything really interesting in those individuals, it would probably be the case that it wouldn't have been worth um, looking at uh, more novice practitioners mm. uh, since the novices had not practiced very much. Uh, yeah. And so w that's where we began with the very long-term practitioners. And these are individuals uh, who have each uh, formally practiced a minimum of 10,000 hours throughout their life. Uh, and uh, in addition, every one of them uh, um, went through at least one three-year retreat where uh, they were practicing every single day uh, for every day of the year, uh, a minimum of eight hours a day for three continuous years, never leaving the retreat site. Uh, and so uh, these are all very accomplished practitioners. The average among these uh, is about 34,000 hours of practice, uh, and it goes up to 62,000 hours of practice. So uh, these are extremely accomplished practitioners. And um, what we had them do uh, for the specific sake of the experiment was to generate a particular kind of compassion uh, that the practitioners call non-referential compassion. And what's meant by non-referential compassion is the following. Usually when we engage in um, compassion practices, and we can talk more in a more granular way about what they are in a moment, but usually we bring to mind, we call to mind and bring into our heart specific individuals. It may be a loved one who is suffering. It may be um, some unacquaintance that we know, uh, and we bring them into our mind and heart, and then we um, uh, cultivate in one way or another the aspiration that they be relieved from suffering, that they live a life of joy and well-being, and so forth. Um, in this particular case, back to the long-term practitioners, we had them generate this 
quality of non-referential compassion where they were not bringing any specific person to mind. They were just literally generating the feelings of connectedness, the feelings of um, uh, wishing to relieve suffering uh, uh, without any specific individual. And the reason we did that is for strictly experimental purposes because invoking a specific person, uh, the face of the person would actually um, recruit certain brain circuits uh, mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps uh, recruit those circuits differentially depending upon how familiar they were with the individual and so forth. It would also recruit um, memory circuits that uh, are involved in retrieving information about those individuals and about times in their life when they may have been suffering. And so from a, an experimental design perspective, from a strictly scientific perspective, if it was possible for these individuals to generate a state of pure compassion with no other, in the words of one of our practitioners, with no other reasoning consideration or discursive thoughts, then this would be ideal because we can then look at the neural correlates of pure compassion unconfounded by memory retrieval, by um, uh, uh, visualizing their face and so forth. And so that's what we did in this experiment. Uh, and um, we found uh, uh, using two different techniques to interrogate human brain function. One is by looking at brain electrical signals and the other is with functional magnetic resonance imaging. We found um, very robust differences uh, when the long-term practitioners were generating compassion compared with a co control group uh, uh, who, who were all taught this compassion practice and practiced for one week uh, but um, uh, and were interested in learning to practice but were just at the very, very, very beginning. Can you say what kind of differences you found and, and what their practical, let's say, relevance would be? Certainly. So, um, you know, among the long-term practitioners using functional MRI, uh, one of the circuits that we found to be activated uh, very strongly in response to compassion and um, uh, and, and one of the ways we probe the brain is by presenting certain stimuli to the practitioners while they're meditating. And we decided that we would present um, auditory signals, vocal cues, that, that reflect human suffering. Mm. For example, uh, the unconsolable cry of a baby or the scream of an adult. Uh, these are nonverbal sounds of human suffering. And we presented them to the practitioners while they're meditating on compassion. And what we found uh, first is that uh, areas in the brain which we know to be critical for perspective taking, for taking the perspective of another, um, were very strongly activated. Um, one key region is the temporoparietal junction, which sits in the back of the head, and it's at the intersection of the temporal lobe and the parietal lobe. Uh, and this is an area that's been implicated in perspective taking, in studies of empathy, and other kinds of uh, social neuroscientific studies. And this area becomes very strongly activated during the compassion practice. Uh, another um, part of the circuit which is strongly activated is uh, an area called the insula. And the insula is a cortical region uh, uh, that is part of the frontal cortex uh, that is involved with uh, bidirectional communication between the brain and the body. Uh, the insula is the only region in the brain that has a, um, uh, a geographic map of the visceral organs. Uh, and so the visceral organs literally project to the insula and it is through the insula that information about the body can get conveyed to other brain circuits. Uh, the insula also has descending connections down to our autonomic organs uh, and it is through these descending connections that the insula can influence the function of the body. 
And it's, you know, kind of interesting, I think, that uh, during compassion training or compassion practice, uh, the insula is so intimately involved. Uh, it suggests that compassion meditation is really uh, very much a mind-body kind of practice. It involves um, both the mind and the body in very important ways. Um, using brain electrical measurements, uh, we look at completely different, a different class of phenomena there, and uh, using those measurements, we observed very high amplitude gamma oscillations that were highly synchronized across widespread regions of the brain. Uh, gamma oscillations uh, have been strongly implicated in synaptic plasticity. Uh, they are associated with forming new connections. And um, the presence of these widespread gamma oscillations may be associated with um, individuals who are um, learning to associate certain cues of suffering uh, with the disposition to help relieve that suffering. Um, uh, it also may reflect a state of uh, uh, perceptual acuteness and clarity uh, and luminosity uh, when uh, these um, uh, signs of suffering are encountered. So those are some of the uh, um, uh, changes that we've observed when these long-term practitioners are engaging in this compassion meditation practice. Mm. What did you take away from that in terms of your sense of, you could say, the upper reaches, if you will, of human potential with regarding compassion? Well, when we first were collecting the data um, with the brain electrical measurements, we were uh, absolutely stunned because uh, the changes are so robust uh, and so dramatic that we are able to observe them with the naked eye, which is almost never the case uh, in this kind of research. You usually need um, a lot of signal enhancement and signal processing, which requires many hours of computational time uh, before you see if a signal is present. Uh, and here, as we were testing the practitioners, we can literally see the signal in front of us. So one of the things that this um, underscored for me is how uh, incredibly dramatic uh, these changes really are, um, because that's just something we don't see on an everyday basis. Uh, secondly, um, it, the, in the functional MRI findings, the circuits that were recruited in Compassion um, were very interesting because they're circuits that have been implicated in perspective taking, also in um, mind-body interaction, and um, the circuits are dramatically regulated by the um, expression of compassion, and uh, it underscored how we can <clears throat> really influence the functioning of many different circuits in the brain by adopting a certain stance toward our world uh, um, uh, through our um, pure mental activity. So in this case, it was the practitioners adopting the stance of, um, uh, of feeling compassion uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and, and filling their mind with compassion, and that was sufficient to produce the, this whole cascade of changes. Uh, and so... Um, uh, it uh, certainly suggests to us that the ability to uh, influence the mind and the brain in that way could be of tremendous utility when um, suffering is encountered in our world because it can tune people into it and um, prepare them to act in a skillful way. Right. Well, thank you for that. And if I may ask you a personal question... Uh, you've spent quite a lot of time, as you say, uh, studying people with a with a profoundly deep contemplative practice. Um, I should add, I, and correct me if I'm mistaken here, uh, in the Buddhist tradition, obviously the world has many contemplative traditions, and in particular the more Tibetan wing of that uh, tradition. Is that correct, Richie, so far? Tibetan Buddhists primarily? Uh, those were the uh, practitioners in the original studies that I've just described using long-term practitioners. More recently, we have been studying uh, a wider range of 
traditions all within Buddhist practice, but uh, including uh, Theravadan practitioners as well as uh, Tibetan yeah. practitioners. Okay, then. Uh, so, in terms of these, thank you, and in terms of the contemplatives you've known, how, how has your encounter, if you will, or your encounters with their compassion, if I may ask you, how's that affected you personally? I mean, what, how have you gained from that as an individual? Uh, well, it's moved me uh, just uh, extraordinarily deeply. Uh, one of the um, incredible uh, um, privileges that I've had doing this work is um, to have these individuals in our laboratory uh, and to be around them uh, and uh, to work with them. And uh, just by their very presence, they um, uh, express these qualities uh, all the time, or at least I, it, that's in my experience and, and in the experience of many folks who work with them in our lab. Um, uh, <laughs> we even had a, an episode uh, uh, um, uh, after one of our long-term practitioners left, uh, the manager of the hotel that just borders on our campus where we have them stay simply because it's very convenient to the lab just a 10-minute walk, the manager called me, and I thought there must have been some screw-up with the payment because it was automatically billed to the university, and he was just calling me to thank me for having such wonderful people stay in the hotel because a number of the help commented that uh, uh, the, um, uh, the individual who had just stayed there was just so kind and uh, um, stopped to talk to many people and... Uh, uh, they just remarked on what a wonderful person he was. Uh, yeah. And uh, the manager just wanted to encourage me to um, uh, uh, to keep bringing them to the hotel. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> That's really great. Well, that's maybe a segue to the next question, which is, so now thinking about regular people, as it were, uh, hotel managers, uh, uh, others who don't have 10,000 or more lifetime hours of practice, um, what are your notions or you know, plausible speculations, if you will, or, or actual findings about how compassion practices, uh, both formal practices, 10, 20, 30 or more minutes a day, as well as in particular informal, kind of on the fly practices, where I think so much of life really happens, you know, on the fly. Um, how can those sorts of practices, uh, or how might those sorts of practices, change the brains of regular people? Uh, it's a wonderful question, Rick, and it's a question which has both uh, clear pragmatic import as well as uh, important theoretical uh, consequences. And uh, because of that, we have been deeply interested in learning more about that. And uh, uh, not um, not long ago, we completed a study where we were examining the impact of short-term compassion training in individuals who were otherwise complete novices, who had never meditated before. And um, this is, uh, again, an issue of, of great practical importance, but for us, there were also critical scientific issues because in this kind of study we can randomly assign individuals uh, to different groups. So from a scientific perspective, the study of long-term practitioners is really cool and really interesting, but ultimately it's unsatisfying. And the reason why ultimately it's unsatisfying is because um, the skeptics say, well, these individuals are incredibly unusual to begin with. Who would devote their life to something like this? Who would spend three years uh, at a retreat center? Certainly not most people, uh, and they're right. Most people wouldn't do something like that. And so the skeptic goes on to say that maybe these individuals were like that to begin with. Maybe their meditation practice had absolutely nothing to do with the cultivation of their compassion. Uh, and we cannot answer that question in a rigorous way um, from the studies of the long-term practitioners. We have um, uh, examined in the long-term practitioners the relation between the number of hours of lifetime practice based on an extensive interview that we conduct with them and the 
changes in the brain that we observe. And in many of our measures, we do find those associations, but those are just correlations. And uh, uh, again, from a hardness scientific perspective, uh, they are not definitive. And so using short-term compassion training, we can randomly assign people to either a group that is instructed in compassion practices or a group that is taught another uh, strategy to promote well-being that does not involve contemplative practices. And the strategy that we chose to compare uh, to compassion was one based on cognitive therapy, which is one of the most empirically well-validated treatments, um, non-pharmacological treatments for anxiety and depression, and also uh, has been found to promote well-being. So participants signed up for this study, and when they signed up, they were told that they can learn one of two practices, one of two methods that are both designed to promote well-being. And they were truly randomly assigned to either the compassion group or this cognitive um, training group. And they then went through two weeks of training where they were given guided meditation practices 30 minutes each day. So here we're talking about 30 minutes a day for 14 days, a total of seven hours of practice in individuals who otherwise never meditated before. And we did a, a, an MRI scan before and then after two weeks of practice. And amazingly, we found in this study that there were significant changes uh, from before to after two weeks of training in the compassion group that we did not see in the cognitive training group. But even more interesting, uh, we measured uh, behavioral changes <clears throat> that might be associated with compassion. And this is a very tough problem for uh, us scientists to figure out how we can measure compassion in the laboratory mm -hmm. or how we can measure the echoes of compassion in the laboratory. And uh, uh, I won't go into a lot of detail here because it would take me a bit far afield and get technical very quickly, uh, but um, we used uh, an economic decision-making task um, that um, basically measures a person's propensity to behave altruistically, where they actually use some of their own money to render a transaction that they witness to be more fair. Uh, so it actually costs them real money to um, promote altruism. Uh, and uh, what we found is that after two weeks of compassion training, the practitioners uh, were behaving more altruistically and uh, they showed corresponding changes in their brain uh, mm. which correlated with their propensity to behave altruistically. And we did not find the same kind of changes in the cognitive training group. So this indicates that two weeks of practice, just a total of seven hours, is enough to actually see observable changes in the brain and behavior. Pretty remarkable. Um, yeah. And it, uh, I think, underscores how, um, how flexible our minds and brains really are. And with just a little bit of training, um, individuals, I think, can really <laughs> notice a difference. Right. It's very hopeful, I think, uh, that, as you said, uh, you know, half an hour a day for two weeks could produce measurable changes in the brain as well as changes in how people act. And um, for me, you know, it's, it's both hopeful as well as it takes one, as you said in the very beginning, to uh, your point about the sense that it's important for people to take responsibility. Uh, for the changes that are endlessly occurring inside their own brains and, you know, guide them in a better direction. So along those, along those lines, Richie, I wonder now if you could talk about what you've um, seen in the lab or reflected on personally as to some of the factors, mental or neural, that promote compassion. What are the kinds of things that people can do that are informed, uh, if you will, by neuroscience to uh, warm up their own hearts uh, or to help cultivate more compassion inside themselves or let's say they're a parent with a child uh, we'll be talking more about that in the next interview um, you know to help other people be compassionate as well what makes a difference well uh, it's a great question and 
in my um, experience, uh, as well as uh, through the conduct of the research that we've been doing, uh, there are a few reflections that I have. Uh, one is um, focusing on others uh, uh, seems to be a very important quality which uh, can help promote compassion. Uh, and actually, paradoxically, or maybe not so paradoxically, um, the focus on another's well-being is probably a much more direct route to one's own well-being than focusing on one's own well-being. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are actually good experimental studies now uh, that are consistent with, with that idea. So um, uh, focusing on others, I think, is really important. And um, in terms of uh, how to help others uh, to find this quality in themselves and to... Uh, uh, engage in, in more compassionate activity, uh, I think that uh, probably the most important thing that any individual person can do uh, is really to work on themselves and to uh, help to uh, cultivate more compassion in themselves. And through uh, the um, expression of that compassion, uh, individuals can then radiate uh, these qualities and osmotically impact uh, the behavior of others around them. One of the um, striking possibilities is that the best way that it may be to study compassion uh, in the laboratory may not so much be to study the individuals who are expressing compassion, but rather to study the impact that those individuals have on others in their immediate surround. Um, one of the uh, striking things that I've observed is um, spending time around His Holiness the Dalai Lama. He is someone who um, uh, is radiating this quality all the time. And um, most people uh, in his presence really feel it uh, and really um, uh, just are touched by the depth of his caring uh, and uh, simple acts in which he engages really help to promote others' um, well-being and to relieve their suffering. Uh, on this note, I had um, a wonderful experience last spring. I was um, at a meeting uh, at the Mayo Clinic with the Dalai Lama in, in Rochester, Minnesota. And I don't know how many listeners or viewers have ever gone to the Mayo Clinic there, but um, uh, there are uh, a whole maze of underground tunnels uh, walking tunnels that connect the various buildings. Um, there must be 15 buildings uh, in this complex, and they're all connected by these underground tunnels, and everybody uses them. They're very uh, well populated, and the winters are cold there, and so this enables people to get from building to building without having to go outside. And I was walking with His Holiness from one room to the other, or one building to another, uh, and Individuals uh, who are um, receiving medical treatment are wheeled in wheelchairs or in stretchers in, this, in these tunnels. And um, His Holiness stopped at every single person who was obviously there to receive medical attention. Every person in a wheelchair, every person in a stretcher. And he just reached out to them. Uh, and um, uh, it took... 45 minutes to walk what might, for most of the people there, was ordinarily uh, maybe a five or ten minute walk. Um, uh, uh, and I think that it just uh, uh, was extraordinary for those of us who are walking with His Holiness to just see what His natural propensity is. And uh, I'm absolutely convinced that He made a difference in every one of those people's lives. That's a very touching story, and I'm going to keep it with me. Um, but what, do you, what would you say, Rishi, to people who say, who might say, well, that's the Dalai Lama. You know, he grew up in a tradition. He does a lot of practice every day. But I, this person might say, I'm running on empty. I'm fried. I'm mistreated. I've got a lot on my plate. I'm worn out. I'm stressed. I'm depressed. I'm anxious. I'm irritated. Um, how can I muster uh, good wishes for others when I don't even have good wishes for myself. 
It's a, a wonderful question. And, you know, the, the really deeply honest answer, Rick, is I'm not sure. Uh, mm -hmm. But I certainly, um, uh, from where I sit, would suggest certain things. Um, one is that uh, we can begin these practices um, in a very simple way for a very short amount of time. Uh, we do not know from a scientific perspective um, how little is needed to actually see some effect uh, on some measurable parameter. There are studies that are published in the scientific literature showing that um, individuals who've never meditated before, who do eight minutes of compassion or loving kindness uh, related meditation practice, uh, that there are measurable behavioral changes that can be observed after just eight minutes. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, I think that short amounts of practice, particularly if they're done repeatedly, uh, can indeed uh, make a real difference. And if someone is really anxious and really stressed and finds a very difficult time focusing on others, um, they can... Uh, direct these thoughts either to themselves or to a loved one who they really do care about. Uh, it could be a parent, um, who, who, someone who may have died, um, but just envision a time in their life when they may have been suffering and then cultivate the aspiration that they be relieved of that suffering at that time. Just going through that um, for whoever one can do it with. And if, if one can't even find a person, even oneself to do it with, you can do it for uh, a pet that you may have had. Um, uh, and so I think that um, most people are able to find some being uh, on the planet that they can do this with um, uh, without generating too much conflict or stress. And uh, I would say just begin wherever you can. And um, uh, it's very likely that even really short amounts of practice can make a difference. Mm. Again, very, very hopeful and inspiring. Um, and next to last question, if you will, uh, if I may ask a personal one. Uh, you've studied compassion uh, scientifically. You've been around people who've, who've been practicing it deeply. Um, how have you shifted over the last 20-ish years, if you will, since you really been began investigating this territory in terms of, you know, bringing compassion uh, into daily life, let's say, where the rubber meets the road. I mean, it's, I think it's easy to have compassion for people that are treating us really, really well. Uh, how about compassion for others who are aggravating or are very much not my tribe, if you will? I mean, how have you shifted? How have you changed, if I may ask, in terms of your own compassion broadly defined for others? Well, it's been a wonderful and um uh, helpful and inspiring uh, and at times difficult and challenging journey. Um, uh, first, my own practice, uh, I certainly um, have incorporated these kinds of practices in a very regular way in my daily routine, um, but even more importantly, I have um, really uh, tried uh, to bring this into my everyday environment, my everyday life. Uh, I run a very large laboratory. I live in a um, very competitive academic world, um, the world of uh, modern neuroscience is a tough world uh, in many ways, and uh, the academy in general is a very unforgiving and um, not a particularly compassionate place uh, in my view. Uh, and where we can where we have some influence and where we can really change things is in our own local environment. And we have um, really gone to, I think, quite extraordinary lengths in our own center to help make compassion um, something that we value and something that we practice every single day. Um, uh, and so... Um, we learn, we're, we're, and we're all in the process of learning this, how can we deliver incisive, razor-sharp, uh, and critical scientific feedback, but do it in a way which is compassionate? Do it in a way where um, we're giving this razor-sharp feedback, and at the same time, 
uh, telling everyone, you know, that we really tremendously value them and we love them. Uh, so, um, uh, and it's a challenge in, in an academic environment. It is not easy. Uh, and uh, uh, there is a lot of variation among individuals in, um, you know, in, in the extent to which they get it, so to speak. Uh, and so this is something that I've taken on uh, with um, uh, a real fervent commitment. Uh, uh, and um, we work on this a lot in, in our lab. We have retreats about it. We, um, we have uh, certain values that everyone knows where, where compassion is um, one of the um, central ones. Uh, and these are the values that we try our best to live by. Mm. How do you do that when someone is being aggravating? In other words, let's suppose you someone's said something or written something uh, really unfair, let's say, or, or in, in everyday life you're you're bumping into someone who's being pretty pretty aggravating. Let's say maybe you, let's let's presume you're truly objectively being mistreated. Um, how do you muster? Uh, compassion in those kind of rubber meets the road moments. Well, I think you know one of the things that you learn is that when people behave like that, it's usually because they're suffering, mm. uh, and um, uh, and they're not seeing the world clearly. Uh, and that kind of clouded perception really comes from um, from uh, blinders and uh, um, delusions. Uh, uh, that are associated with suffering. Uh, and so if we can appreciate that and realize that the person is not um, behaving like this because they, they really want to behave like this or because um, they think it's great to be, um, you know, really nasty, uh, they're behaving like this because they probably just don't really know how else to behave. And um, uh, they're behaving like this because they are product of um, various causes and conditions which led them to be that way, uh, which are is likely resulting in their suffering. And if we can then muster um, that kind of understanding, it becomes a little easier for us uh, mm -hmm. to be more forgiving and to be gentler and um, not to react to them. Um, and if we think that they're engaging in wrong action, this is not, the cultivation of compassion is not something that should make us weak in the mm -hmm. face of um, um, problems or uh, a wrong view, um, but it should allow us to skillfully confront it in a way where we're challenging the action or the idea and not condemning the person who is the vehicle for that uh, action or idea's expression. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to do it. I'm going to ask you the last question that's really in my mind here on this run, which is, I mean, there you're speaking about uh, taking perspective, if you will, that the other person is suffering and there are various causes leading them to suffer and so forth. Uh, and that is a really important part of compassion, obviously. But going back to the research you talked about in the very beginning, in terms of the insula, really tuning into the body, I'm wondering if, if I could push it here a smidge and just ask you, is there anything in your own practice that you do in terms of connecting with your heart or tuning into your body in some way um, that helps you uh, embody, if you will, uh, this perspective about the suffering of the other person uh, when, let's suppose, someone's being challenging toward you? Well, um, you know, I think that uh, in those kind of situations we're often a knee-jerk reaction, which um, you know often occurs in, in myself and in many others that I see, is um, to focus on ourselves. Uh, how is this person affecting me? Um, how um, it, how are my goals being impeded? Uh, um, it's all about me, and if we can um, somehow break out of that and. Um, uh, and, and have uh, arise more spontaneously uh, a focus on the other, uh, it can really just completely reframe the whole issue. Mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, but that's right. something that you know will will not come automatically, I think, to most people, and is something that um, that I will benefit from training. Uh, uh, and I think from training uh, that propensity for uh, concern with the other to arise more spontaneously and automatically uh, is um, becomes uh, 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 an increased possibility. Mm. That's great. And your work has been so central in, in giving people conviction and confidence in that possibility. Well, truly my last question. Uh, if you could offer one encouragement uh, to people listening or viewing, uh, uh, and however you want to answer this question is fine. If you could offer one encouragement uh, to people, what would it be? Uh, my encouragement uh, would be simply that uh, we are not fixed uh, in who we are, uh, that change is possible, and uh, to quote uh, from the Dalai Lama's book, The Art of Happiness, uh, the wiring in our brains is not fixed. Uh, our brains are also adaptable. And from that um, perspective, uh, we can change our relationship to uh, the suffering of others. We can change uh, how we um, uh, how we respond to life slings and arrows. We can take more responsibility uh, for that um, by simply uh, intentionally engaging in um, uh, certain kinds of thoughts and feelings and practices uh, to cultivate um, uh, attitudes of compassion and of kindness to toward others, and that this is something that is possible for each of us. Uh, uh, neuroplasticity exists throughout the entire lifespan. It's never too late, and even really short amounts of practice can make a difference. Uh, and so I think that um, the idea that these kinds of mental exercises, if you will, or mental practices will be of some benefit, I think will um, be an idea that will be embraced by the culture in a more widespread way um, very, very soon. I think we're close to a tipping point where the evidence is sufficiently compelling so that mental exercise will be regarded uh, as um, physical exercise was um, a few decades ago when more and more people started to engage in regular physical exercise. Well, thank you, Richie. Um, this has been a far-reaching conversation, and I really appreciate your time here and the centrality, really, of, of everything you've said. I'm so glad we had the opportunity um, for you to really be the cornerstone, as it were, uh, of this entire series. Um, Next week, I should mention to people, or in the following uh, interview, we'll have Dr. Dan Siegel uh, as the guest. Uh, he's a psychiatrist, a, a great uh, author, and also um, co-director of the Mindful Awareness Research Center at uh, uh, UCLA. And so he'll be talking about the connections, really, between compassion and mindfulness, uh, both uh, for ourselves and for other people. I should say before I hand it over to Randy that I also really want to recommend uh, Dr. Davidson's book, The Emotional Life of Your Brain. Uh, it really is uh, a, a classic and um, comes from someone who, as you can tell, obviously has an enormous heart as well as an enormous and excellent mind. So, Richie, thank you again for being here with us. Thank you so much, Rick. It was my pleasure. Great. What well, a I'll turn it over to Randy now and say bye, folks. and. Uh, be with you in the next uh, the next interview of this series. I completely enjoyed this evening. As someone here who's a producer at Sounds True, who works very closely with positive neuroplasticity, I have some background, but I had no idea how much I'd enjoy the information. I've never worked with Dr. Davidson's before. How clear, how practical, how deep 
the information that he was able to communicate and the hopeful vision at the very end that this is possible and within reach for all of us. And not only is it within reach of all of us, that if we're not using it, we're actually missing an opportunity to bring ourselves health, compassion, and love. And so I'm very pleased that, that this initiary, initi initiation into this seven-week series that we'll be hosting here. The next session, as Dr. Hansen mentions, with, is with Dr. Dan Siegel, someone else I pr produce with extensively, one of my favorite people in the entire world also one of the most practical and clear and able to clarify these issues in a way that we can all understand them. So I'm excited about that. That's next Monday. It's October 15th at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then remember, you can, and I would suggest you do this, re-listen to this program as someone with a lot of experience in this field. There's a lot of information, a lot of practical information, a lot of useful information that was distilled down here in very precise terms. And you'll do yourself a favor by re-listening and reinforcing the information that you learned to Tonight. So if you want to re-listen to any of tonight's session, you just go to the Sounds True website and it will be available at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Wednesday. That's two nights from tonight on October 10th. And I also want to tell everyone, as we talked about here tonight, the idea is we're building a community of help and support for others. And one of the ways that we get this information to be effective in the world is to be able to communicate it to others. This, se this series, I believe, is a very important series, and I would like you to encourage anyone that you know of that you think might be interested in taking this program and listening to this information and incorporating this, uh, pr these practices into their lives to bring themselves and the world a greater sense of compassion. It's a gift that you can give them. It's a free online seven-week program on how positive neuroplasticity can bring you the sense of happiness and joy and compassion that you're looking for and your friends as well. So please go online, look for Compassionate Brain, Rick Hansen, free online sign up where you'll be directed to and sign up and you'll get information on the next six weeks and you'll also be able to see all of the programs uh, whenever you like on the archived version. And if anyone is interested in self-compassion, Kristen Neff is coming up in a couple of weeks, and she is specifically, the question came up here about building self-compassion. I really want to encourage your work coming to see that, listen to that program as well. So she's someone I work with who I am very excited about working with. And so it's for, I'm going to bring this to an end tonight. So for Sounds True, good night. This is Randy Rourke. Thanks for being with us. Soundstrue.com. Many voices, one journey.